Good day, everybody. My name is Darwin again. If you uh, have not yet met me, I'm the pastor at Kingsway. It's a privilege now for me to um, expound, explain, preach God's word that's been preached to us just then, that's been read to us just then. Uh, I don't know whether you've had this experience before, um, speaking to somebody, and you just want one particular information from them, but they end up talking about a lot of other things without giving you that one piece of information that you want. So, for example, I spoke to a salesperson at one time. Um, I know some of you are in sales, so this is not speaking against you. I'm sure you do a very good job. And speaking to this salesperson, I, I asked I asked them one simple question, which is the most important question of all, how much does it cost? But he proceeded to give me an answer, but not giving me the answer I want. He, he gave me a lot of details on a lot of things that I didn't really ask, that I, nor did I want, and still at the end, he still hasn't given me the price. Now, the reason I'm telling you this is because I think when we go through a passage like Genesis 1, and we're beginning our series in Genesis 1 to 11, I think we can often make the same mistake in that we can talk a lot about a lot of interesting things, but that's not quite the point. You see, we can talk a lot about very interesting things, but they won't help you when you're struggling with the brokenness of the world. But they won't help you when you need to choose to live for Jesus or walk away from Jesus. They won't help you to keep loving the people that you find hard to love. They won't help you when life disappoints. What we really need as we approach any part of the Bible, really, and especially here because this is what we're going through now, what we need is the good news from God through the words of Scripture. What we need is the good news, as we go through Genesis chapter 1 today, is the good news from God read in light of Jesus Christ. That's what we need. Right? And that's what we're going to focus on today. I'm going to lead us in prayer, and after that, we're going to go through the passage together. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we give you praise that you are a God who speaks to us, who tells us important things. Father, help us to listen carefully because every word that comes out of your mouth, words that have been inscripturated for us and preserved for us for generations, for thousands of years, preserved so carefully, divinely preserved, in fact, they are words important to us today. So help us to listen carefully. Help us not to get distracted by things that, are, that really don't matter. Help us to listen to the good news that you have for us in Jesus Christ in these words in Genesis chapter 1. And as we listen, move our hearts, Lord, closer to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So, I'm going to start with Um, A bit of explanation on how we're going to read Genesis chapter 1 to 11. I think this is really important, how to read these chapters. And then after that, I'm going to tell you three things that we can get from this passage. It's important to know how to read this this, this passage because we don't want to end up, like I said, we don't want to end up talking about unimportant things. Uh, we don't want to miss the point. So we need to ask firstly the question, what, what is the genre of Genesis chapter 1 to 11? Uh, you know Genesis is the first book of the Pentateuch, uh, so the five books of the law. It's actually not five different books. It's actually w- the first scroll of the one big book, which is the law of Moses. So we need to understand what is the genre of Genesis 1 to 11? What is it that we are reading? Are we supposed to read it literally? Is it just poetry, for example, like the book of Psalms? The best way to explain what the genre is, is that it is theological history. Uh, It is talking about things that happened in the past, but it doesn't do it in the way that we would do history today. It, It doesn't do it in the way that we would write history today. It has a different emphasis, a completely different style of of writing 
things that happened in the past. It does it through, really, storytelling. So if you notice, when you read the book of Genesis and then Exodus and Deuteronomy and all, all the way to, to Samuel, you, you find that it's a lot of storytelling. It does it through storytelling, and it's actually emphasizing the teaching of theology rather than the details of history. Because here now, today, in the 21st century, the details of history is really important to us. We, we don't want your opinion, we want the facts, but that's not what Genesis is all about. That, that's not how Genesis is written. Genesis is written to teach theology, and it does it through storytelling, telling a story of things that had happened in the past. And Genesis 1 to 11, especially, especially Genesis 1 to 11, it does recount the past, but it does it in an imprecise way. It covers an unknown length of time. It doesn't say how long Genesis 1 to 11, the period that it covers. Uh, it, it, and it, it talks about an unknown period in history. It, I guess it's a bit like in a galaxy far, far away, a long, long time ago. It, it's supposed to be imprecise. Uh, it uses very obvious figurative language that's not supposed to be read literally. And there are moments where you would notice that it's not even chronological. Even in chapter 1 of Genesis, uh, you notice that the trees were made first and then humans, but in chapter 2, humans first, then God planted trees for them. Uh, so chronological order is not particularly important to the writer of Genesis. That's not how they write history. So you won't be able to find out, for example, how old the earth is. Is it millions of years or is it 6,000 years? Or whether Homo sapiens evolved from something else or did it just came out of the dust? Because that's not the point of Genesis 1. That's not what it's trying to do. It's more concerned about, again, the teaching of theology. It's more concerned about telling us who God is and what God's relationship is with us and with the world. And so, you cannot read Genesis chapter 1, you cannot do it, um, and compare it with a scientific journal, for example. You can't. You can't compare it with a scientific journal or a newspaper article. Because Genesis was not written for people who live in the 21st century. I mean, what I mean by that is we are not its original readers. It's not written the way we would write history today. Now, it's very relevant to us. Please don't misunderstand me. Genesis is incredibly relevant to us. But remember, we are not the original readers. The original readers live in a completely different time, in a totally different culture. They live in what we call the ancient Near East, and that's an area now that we now call the Middle East. It's a, in, in the period between 4000 BC to 500 BC. This is the civilization or the cultural context in which the Old Testament was written. And so when you compare Genesis 1 with things that were written in that period, you actually see a lot of similarities. And when you compare Genesis 1 with the creation accounts of the ancient Near East civilizations, you actually find a lot of similarities. For example, this, the something called the Enuma Elish, when on high, that's the translation of the Enuma Elish, it's a Babylonian creation story, probably written sometime in 1000 BC or something like that. And it, it tells a story about how the god, the god Marduk, murdered Tiamat, the goddess of the chaotic ocean, using his wind spear. And having defeated Tiamat, Marduk used the dead body of the goddess Tiamat to create the world. Or uh, another creation story, this is a Canaanite poem, how the god Baal defeated Yam, the god of the sea. And then presumably, we, we don't know because that's when um, we lost a lot of what was being written. Uh, presumably, that's when, after that, he created the world. The creation account of Genesis actually uses a very similar style, even uses similar language, similar metaphor. 
But that's not to say, and it's very obvious, as I told you those two creation stories, that's not to say that the creation account in Genesis is just like the creation myths of the Babylonians or the Canaanites or the Egyptians. In fact, it's actually markedly different, and it's the differences that matter the most. It's really important. It's the differences that matter the most. Because Genesis is a work of polemic. Do you know what that means? It's actually written against, it's written to contend against the prevailing view of the nations around Israel. It's written to Israel so that they realize that reality is not how the rest of the world imagined it to be. It's not how the Babylonians and the Canaanites or the Egyptians imagined it to be. And it's true for us today, too. Genesis 1 is written for us as we read it, and we have to understand it in the context, in its original cultural context, obviously, to be able to interpret it, pro- to be able to imper- interpret it properly. As we read Genesis 1, it's telling us that reality is not how today's world, our world today, describe what reality is. It's not how the secular, materialistic, expressive, individualistic society that we live in today imagines the world to be. It is not how the YOLO or the FOMO or the Hakuna Matata worldview of today's generation imagine the world to be. The differences are what matters the most. It tells them and it tells us not to be like the world around them. It tells them that the God who made the universe is not like the gods of the nations around them. It tells them that they can keep being faithful to to Yahweh, the Lord God, who rescued Israel out of Egypt, because there's good news. The God they knew as Yahweh is the good God who made the good world, and that humans are at the pinnacle of God's creation made in His image, and that He made the world so that people can have rest in Him. That's the good news I want to show to you today from Genesis 1. The God they knew is a God who made a good world. And that humans are at the pinnacle of God's creation made in His image, and that God made a world so people can share in His rest. And that's good news, isn't it? All right, that's a bit of a longer introduction, but I think it's really important for us to get our heads together on how to read Genesis, particularly 1 to 11. Here's the good news, number one, the good God who created a good world. You see, it's really different, isn't it, compared to the creation story of Babylon and and Canaan, because it says in chapter 1, verse 1, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. In the beginning, it wasn't a pantheon of gods battling each other like the Babylonian creation story. In the beginning, from eternity to eternity, there was God. And He acted in creation, creating the heavens and the earth. This is the beginning of time and space as we know it. Not only that, this is a God who spoke and the world came to be. That should say a lot about the importance of the Word of God, doesn't it? As we come to the Word of God now, the Word of God has the power of creation. What is God creating in you today as you hear His words? What is God stirring in your hearts? And this is a God, when we get to chapter chapter 2, verse 4, we know who this God is. This God is the one God. It's not Marduk. It's not Ea, it's not Enlil, it's not Baal. It was Yahweh, the God of Abraham and Isaac and and Jacob, who rescued Israel out of slavery in Egypt. Yahweh is the one created God. Can you see what this is telling the Israelites? This is the God who created the world. This is the one true God, the, the creator of heaven and earth and all things came from Him. This God, Yahweh, is a good God. How do we know? Because He created a good world. That was His intention from the very beginning. 
And so chapter 1 verse 2 begins, funnily enough, we, we think it begins with completely nothing, but actually verse 2, um, it begins with the earth being formless, empty, darkness was over the surface of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. And I think it's really important to say here that it doesn't mean that the earth had always been there, this formless, void, darkness, it's, it's always been there. It's not saying that at all, because we find out from other parts of the Bible that everything came from God. So we're just not told when God created this formless, empty darkness. We just, in verse 2, we just come to it. This is how the writer of Genesis wants to start. And what does God do? God turned a, a formless, empty, dark, chaotic world, which He created, of course, although we're not told here in Genesis. What did He do? He, he brought order. Did you notice the creation account? That the first three days correspond to the second three days? The first three days is the habitat, and then the, the, the second three days is those who inhabit those things? I think the writer of Hebrews is trying to tell us that God, Yahweh, the Creator, God is a, is a God of order. He's not a God of chaos. He, he wants things to be in order in, in its proper right place. And it tells you about how we should see the world, doesn't it? We should desire order. We should want things in its right, proper place. And not only that, He brought goodness. At the end, God says at every time He created something, God saw that it was good. God saw it was good. It was good. It was good. And especially in the end, God saw all that He had made in verse 31, and it was very good. In the beginning, we are introduced to a good God who made a good world, and that God, His name is Yahweh, the God who is good to His creation, to us, mankind. Because when He created mankind, He blessed them and provided for them. Not only did He give Him purpose and meaning, gave them instruction, this is what you are for. You go and be fruitful and increase in number, fill the earth and subdue it, rule over the fish of the sea and the birds in the air. Not only did He give them tasks to do, He blessed them. And He provided them what they needed to achieve that purpose, to live out the meaning of their existence. To the Israelites living in the ancient Near East, it tells them that the world wasn't created out of a battle between gods who in the end really cares very little about mankind. The world isn't about an eternal struggle between good and evil. It was created by a good God, a sovereign God, the only God who created a good world, and His name is Yahweh. I think this is a really big deal for us today too. It tells us that the world is not an accident. It didn't just happen. It tells us that we're not just some random atoms who came together for no reason, for no purpose, and holds no meaning, and one day we will return to stardust. And in a billion years, nothing will ever matter. Whether you've been a good person or not, whether you've been faithful to your spouse or not, it won't matter. Because life is an accident. No, Genesis tells us that God is here for a reason. We are here for a reason. God made us for a reason. Hold on. The slides are going nuts. Let me fix it. Do you know why there's meaning and purpose? Because we are made by a good God who made a good world. There is meaning and purpose to our lives because there is a maker. If there is a maker, that means there is meaning. If that maker is good, then that meaning is good. But if there's no maker, who cares what is good or evil? It's just something that you made up. Why does it matter in six billion years? 
whether you spoke a kind word to your child or you yelled at him. Now, Genesis doesn't tell us everything we need to know, obviously, but it sure says a lot more than our secular materialistic world today. And you know what? When we put on our gospel glasses, when we read this in light of Jesus, we see things so much clearer because we see that that good creator God, the God who made everything and made it good, that God had come in the person of Jesus Christ. The second person of the Trinity, God the Son, is now revealed to us. And there's so many passages that says this. I'm, I, I can't show them all to you. But just remember the beginning of John's gospel. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and that Word became flesh. That God, through whom all things came, became flesh, and His name is Jesus. Or this passage in Colossians chapter 1, verse 15 The Son that is Jesus is the image of the invisible God, the heir, the ruler over all creation. In verse 16, for in Him all things were created. Things in heaven and on earth, invisible or visible, whether thrones or power or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through Him and for Him. You see that? When we put on a gospel glasses, we realize that God had come to us in the person of Jesus Christ, that God that gives us meaning and purpose had come. And you know what else it says? It tells us in greater clarity what our meaning and purpose is. Did you notice that? I read it very quickly, but did you notice the very end? This is why we've been created. We've been created. All things exist for for Him. Let's, let, just let those two words sit in your mind for a moment and let it blow up your world. All things exist for Jesus. See, our world today, you ask people outside who are a secular, materialistic, and many people are like that. Tell, ask them what, what is the meaning and purpose of our lives, and, and they will tell you most likely that we need to invent our own meaning, our own purpose. We need to create our own meaning. If you are good at something, let that be your meaning. Why, why do we do that? Why do we need to create our own meaning and purpose? Because it, there is no purpose or meaning in our lives. That's why we need to make it up. They might think that it's freeing to be able to create your own meaning and, and your own purpose, but it's not freeing. It's not freeing at all. They will tell you if helping people makes you happy, go for it. That's your purpose and meaning. If getting rich, is what you want to become, go for it. That's your purpose in life. If doing nothing is your life goal, watching Netflix all day, that's your meaning. That's the world around us, right? Because they have nothing to offer. You have to make it up yourself because you've got no answer, really. When I was in high school, if we ever get a question in an exam and we don't know the answer to it, the best way to... To, to answer that question, it was you just make up an answer. It doesn't matter whether it's right or wrong. You know, you don't know the answer. You just make something up. You just write something down because the theory is uh, maybe the teacher will be too lazy to read it and just give you a mark for it because if it's blank, you're going to get zero. But if there's something on it, he might pity you or he might not read it and just give you a mark. I think the world does exactly that. We know our purpose, don't we? Genesis tells us that we are creatures made for a purpose because we have a good God who made a good world and we are created through Him and for Him and we are made for Jesus. I think this is such good news because I now know how to live my life. I know what to live for 
and who to live for. I know what I must do, what is worth giving up everything else for. I know how to measure whether I have lived a life well lived. And if you are parents, it tells you how to raise your children. It tells you what purpose and meaning you need to give your children. You want your children to live a good life. You know you don't have to make something up for them. That's the first good news, isn't it? Here's the second one. We are made in the image of God. Verse, chapter 1, verse 26, And God said, Let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness. Now for Israel, living in the ancient Near East, these words were just mind-blowing. To hear that mankind were made in the image of God, in the likeness of God. You know, humanity was not just an afterthought brought about from the blood of a God that they executed because they went to war with them. <laughs> mankind was a deliberately made was made deliberately in a special way and given incredible dignity. In the ancient Near East, kings, emperors, would describe themselves as the image of their gods to justify their rule and their authority. But Genesis chapter 1 says to Israel, all of humanity is made in the image of God. All of us, male and female, both made in the image of God, and I take it to rule over creation together. That's what it means, partly at least, to be made in the image of God in the same way that the ancient Near East kings would rule because they were images of their gods. Mankind would rule over creation because they are images of the one true God. I think this gives us a real sense of unassailable dignity. It's not just kings, but also slaves. It's not just royalty, but also peasants. That is a radical thought in the ancient Near East, and I think it's a radical thought today too. All of us, whatever our skin color, culture, gender, and yes, even whatever our sexual orientation, or ability, or disability, or beliefs, or lack of belief, whether neurotypical or neurodivergent. Genesis 1 tells us an unassailable truth. We are all made in the image of God. It is the very foundation of what we understand as basic human rights and dignity. Which, by the way, if you read, the, apparently I heard a very hard book to read that some of you read, that book, Confronting Christianity, you would know that our secular materialistic world today has no real grounds to believe in any sort of human rights or equality. They argue for human rights and equality and dignity, but their belief system and worldview gives them no foundation to hold that truth. But we Christians, we absolutely do have that foundation because we have Genesis chapter 1, we have these words God created mankind in His own image. In the image of God, He created the male and female. He created them. And when we come with our gospel glasses, we see things even more clearly because, I, I wonder if you notice, it's very obvious. Though we are made in the image of God, we're supposed to rule over creation, but we don't do that, do we? We get killed by microscopic viruses. Our existence on earth is tenuous. We are fragile and broken in so many ways. If you disagree with me, you just haven't lived long enough. I'm really sorry. That's the reality. And even worse, death will come and claim each and every one of us. It is far from the picture of ruling over creation. We are made in the image of God, but something has gone horribly, horribly wrong. I think this is exactly what the book of Hebrews said. We've gone through the book of Hebrews this year. It simply says, yet at present we don't see everything subject to them. 
But then the good news in verse 9, but we do see Jesus. He is the true image of God. He was made lower, verse 9, than the angels for a little while, meaning he became human like you and me. But unlike us, he is truly crowned with glory and honor. Do you see that? Because he suffered death on the cross for you and for me. And here's the good news, that by the grace of God, he might taste death for everyone. Do you know what that means, right? Jesus tasting death for us so we don't have to. We can share in Jesus' glory in verse 10 because he is bringing many sons and daughters to glory. That's where he's taking us. Friends, what good news for all of us who struggle the brokenness of this world. Because in Jesus, there's a way for us to again have that glorious image of God that we should have. Now, the world doesn't get this. They don't have a solution to our brokenness. They look at our brokenness. They don't have a solution. So what does the world do? They bury their head in the the sand. They, They close their eyes and they pretend that it's not there. They look at a broken vase and they say, that vase is not broken. It's beautiful. There's nothing wrong with it. That's how it's always been and it will always be. Don't you dare say otherwise. And they make other people say that there's nothing wrong with it either. And they call it, to call it broken or need fixing is to be cruel and hateful. To say that this vase needs, needs help, it's, it's, to, it's, to, it's to, be, to be a bigot. But we look at that vase and we know it's broken. Now, we're not saying that it has no value. It has great value because it is made in the image of this amazing artist who created the most amazing vase. The artist made it in his own image. Of course it has great value. It needs to be treated with dignity and respect and love. You gotta admit it, it's broken. But you know what? The good news of the gospel says that the artist had come himself to fix the vase, even if it means cutting himself in the process. He wants this vase to be glorious again. Now, If you're thinking that I'm speaking in code because this is recorded and I'm just speaking in code about a certain group of people so that you don't get fired from your job, you're wrong because I'm talking about all of us. We are all broken, aren't we? I'm going to share something really personal now. Um, My dad had a fall a week ago. He's like 82 years old. Please do pray for him. He's in a great deal of pain. And as I was helping to look after him, my heart is broken in pieces. I've never seen him suffering like that. We are far from the picture of images of God who rule over creation. But Genesis 1 has good news. To all of us who are broken, Jesus has good news to all of us who are broken, for you and for me. Jesus is bringing us to glory if we would go with him. Let me quickly finish with the last one. God made a world for rest. Uh, which is really similar to the ancient Near East, by the way. God finished his work and then he rested, but also with a very big difference. You know what the other creation stories say about why God created mankind? All the other creation stories said that the gods created mankind so that they would do the menial work that we don't want, they don't want to do. <laughs> That's why. So they get to rest and humanity kept on working for them. Uh, the gods rested, but mankind doesn't. Some people... Um, have children for that exact reason. I'm just at the sweet spot right now where I can get my kids to do things for me. They're seven and eight, make me coffee in the morning or get a drink from the fridge when I'm sitting on the sofa and they'll helpfully, they, they want to be really helpful, so they go, can you get me a drink? And they'll go and get a drink. It's amazing. Now, you might be thinking, is, is that what Genesis is saying too? God just created humanity so that he can rest and do nothing and humanity does the work. No, because we find in Exodus, remember, it's the same book, we find in Exodus, 
that God invites humanity into His rest. He, he didn't create the world so He can rest and humanity can do all the work. No, He's inviting humanity into His rest. That's what the Sabbath regulation is all about. On the seventh day, is a Sabbath for the Lord your God, verse 10 says. On it you shall do no work. Why? Because, in verse 11, in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth and the sea and, that is in that, and all that is in them, and He rested on the seventh day. The Israelites are told to rest because God rested. You see, humanity is invited, come and rest with God. But of course, the pattern of six days of work and then the seventh day is a day of rest is just a symbol. It's a pointer to something even greater, a weekly reminder of a greater rest that we do not yet have. A great news so that we can clearly see only with the gospel glasses that we wear. And what do we see? We see a God who wants us to rest with Him forever. Forever. God invites us to His eternal rest, not just a day a week, and then go back toiling in the hamster wheel. There's a greater rest for you and for me, where work will not be toil, suffering will be no more, there will be no tear or pain or goodbyes, where there is joy with God forever. This is an invitation to all of us. Will you come to this rest? Do you want to join this rest? Well, you can join it by trusting in Jesus, by holding on to Him. Again, it's good news, isn't it? Good news to us who are tired and weary and exhausted. I told you Genesis 1 is full of good news. The God who made a good world Humanity being made in the image of God and a God who made a world and invites us to rest with Him. Let me pray. Give thanks to God. Heavenly Father, thank You that You speak to us. We pray that this good news might resonate in our hearts and our minds. Help us so that we might follow Jesus, trust in Him, hold on to Him, even when we see the brokenness of the world, when we see that the world is not as good as you described it in Genesis 1. Help us to trust in Jesus until we enter that final rest. Thank you that you give us meaning and purpose. We know how to live now. And thank you that you give us dignity. Help us to show that dignity and respect to one another, to everyone we encounter. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.